Right, folks, I think we'll get started. Uh, everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Good. Um, I'm going to leave the door open just for folk coming in and then we'll shut it, right? Um, so my name's Tiffany. I'm from Commonweal. Uh, thanks very much for having us. Um, thanks very much to Ali for helping organise it, putting up with me, uh, being very patient. <clears throat> um, so just a wee bit about um, what we're hoping to achieve with this tour. Um, as most of you probably know, Common Mule um, started in 2014 and at that point we were inundated with um, people wanting to help support Common Mule, what can we do? And the natural course for that was to start the local groups in the local area, um, which is fantastic. There's over 50 local groups all over Scotland. Um, the Commonwealth national level is obviously a, a very small team um, and limited resources. So each group has been very autonomous, um, focusing on the priorities that matter to them in the local area, and it seems to be working great. Um, but obviously it's fantastic to have this opportunity. A lot has changed since 2014. So our aim is to get out, meet as many locals as possible, um, and reflect on what's worked well, um, think about what our strategy is working forward and how Commonwealth national and local level, level can work closer together. Um, what can we do to make your life easier, um, help you work more effectively, um, help you with the tools for campaigning, etc. So we're hoping to cover as much of that as possible. So it's a very interactive discussion we're hoping for today. Um, so I am going to pass on to my colleague Thomas Swan, first of all. Um, he's a researcher from Loughborough University, um, worked with loads of grassroots organisations, um, looking at the kind of structures I was just talking about, how they can become more effective, what works well, what doesn't. Um, so very excited to be working with him on this. Um, so we started this whole process by getting folk to fill out an online survey. Can I just ask how many folk seen it and filled it out? Okay, just a few. Right, well Tom is going to start just speaking about the results of the survey, okay? So I'm going to pass them on. Thanks very much. Um, so I'll just kind of do, start with a little bit of introduction to um, the research that we've done that um, has kind of influenced some of the stuff we'll hopefully discussed today and some of the stuff that was brought up by the, the survey. And I'll, also give a little bit of um, overview of some of the results from the survey we've got so far. Um, so the research I've been involved with um, is a joint project between Loughborough University and University of Exeter. And as Tiff mentioned, we look at, we're working with different grassroots organisations. So what we're doing is um, based around the idea of co-research or co-production, so actually doing research with these organisations, not just doing research on them. Um, and the groups we've worked with We've been looking at um, the Occupy movement. We've been working with the industrial workers of the world, grassroots independent trade union in the UK, across the world as well. Um, working with Radical Roots, a network of workers and housing co-ops. Um, working with Seeds for Change, which is involved in um, training for facilitation and decision making in grassroots organisations. Um, and also now, obviously, working with Commonweal in this capacity. And our research is focused on the idea of constitutionalising. And what that means, basically, is what happens when people get together in a group and start making agreements, start making decisions, start um, forming positions on things, start making decisions to take action on things. So the process constitutionalising, it doesn't necessarily involve a written constitution. That's the first thing that often comes to mind. What it's really about is the kind of agreements that people make, the kind of ways groups make decisions, the kind of rules that groups decide on for how they, how they organise, how they operate. Um, and crucially for us, it's about how the members of these groups can be empowered to participate. So central to this is the idea of participation in grassroots organisations. And that's one of the things today that we're hopefully going to discuss through thinking about Commonweal at the local level, but also at the national level. So how can you, supporters, the people who are involved on the ground, participate? How can the structures of Commonweal facilitate 
that kind of participation. So I'm going to quickly go through some of the results from the survey that we sent out. Um, so the survey was quite successful. We had around 200 responses. Um, you've got um, a handout with some kind of summary information about some of the demographic details that came out of the survey and also some of the um, responses to the different kind of questions we asked. Um, two of the kind of key points that came out of it for what we want to kind of talk through today are the kind of structures people want to see at local level, so how people um, are involved in their local groups, what kind of decision-making processes go on in the local groups, how the local groups are organised, um, and secondly, one of the other kind of key things that came out of the survey is how these local groups relate to the national organisation of Commonweal and how these local groups relate to one another as a national network. So looking at the results from the survey, one of the key things that came out was that people do want there to be some mutual relationship of influence between the national and the local levels. So by and large, there's a majority from the survey for people who want to say that local groups should have some voice at the national level, however that is. So we can discuss today what that might actually mean in practice, and whether that's being involved in some of the policy work, some of the research that goes on, whether it's involved in national level decision making. There's different ways we can think that through. At the same time, people were quite clear that they would like to see um, national having more of a voice at a local level. So again, we can think about, kind of pick that apart today and think what does that actually mean you know, in terms of coordinated campaigns, in terms of resources that local groups have access to, in terms of communication between local and national, and also between different local, local groups. Um, so I'm not going to say too much more about the results from the survey. You've got some of the kind of very brief summary results there. What I'd like to do is kind of open this out to a broader discussion. Um, so obviously this is being live streamed, not ideal for the people at home watching this online. But what I'd like to do um, for this session and the session later that Craig will run is split you up into a few groups and get you to discuss in your groups the kind of key areas that we're, that we're going to be thinking about. And then we'll have a kind of broader discussion. Um, and we'd also obviously invite people at home who are watching this on live stream to you know, send in any questions they can. So hopefully that can be monitored and we can see if anyone's got any input who's watching this on the live stream. But what we'll start with doing is just split up into groups, maybe four or five people in each group. So we'll get maybe five, six groups on the go. In those groups, what we'd like to do for this first session is thinking about how you would like to see Commonweal organized. So thinking again about participation, about things like decision making, the agreements that are made, the rules that are in place, the kind of campaigns that um, go on, how are they organized, how are they how are the decisions made about those campaigns? How can local get the resources they need from national? What kind of structures do you think should be in place that would facilitate that, that would allow you to do what you want to do as a local group? Is everyone okay with that? Yeah, anyone got any questions before we start that? Yes? Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, so, so, so there's two things there. So one, in terms of how the survey was conducted. So this was sent out um, by email, I believe, to um, the email list, the national email list, and it was promoted on social media as well, is that right? Yeah, and so the local organizers were also invited to have a hand in promoting it. So if people didn't see that, then obviously that's an issue in terms of communication structures, so that's something we can think about as well. Um,
Um, the other thing I'd say in relation to, to the number of responses to this, so we've got 200 responses. Um, in terms of how representative the survey is, we can't really say anything because in order to say how representative it is, you need to know the total number of people involved. We don't know what that number is. There's 4,000 on the email list, is that right? 12, okay, 12, yeah. But obviously, we, there's no idea whether they're all active people or people who just gave their email address at some point. So there's no way really to know um, whether 200 is representative. If two people here filled it out, then obviously it's not going to be representative of this group. Um, but what we're thinking about getting from the survey is more things that the people who did fill the survey out are highlighting as important issues. We're not trying to see how representative it is. Okay, are there any other questions on the survey before we kind of move on? Okay, so, oh yeah, one question at the back there. Um, do you want to just, just wait one second for the microphone? Say much more than Eddie Kinson from the NP. Uh, what we are out to do is to get rid of the Tories. We have to get rid of the Tories, whether it's common weal, socialism, or, or rank insurrection. We have to get rid of the Tories and get our own country back. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> There'll be plenty of time to discuss how we do that in the next session. Absolutely. Um, so for now then, we split up into groups of you know, four or five, just with the people you're sitting beside, um, and have a think about what structures you would like to see in Commonweal. You can be, be as imaginative as you want with this. Really, this is completely open. So just be as imaginative, as utopian as you would like. What would you like to see in terms of structures for Commonweal that, that increase participation and that allow you to do what you want to do as a local group?
Hi everyone. Um, we'll bring the discussion back in a second and see what, try and have a look at what the different groups have been discussing, what ideas we can maybe share across these groups. Just before we do that, I just want to say quickly, um, in the following session, Craig is going to be focusing on the um, six key policy areas paper that Commonweal put out. So thinking about what the Scottish Government can do now in terms of um, with the powers they've got in terms of uh, domestic agenda. So for the second session we'll focus on that. As I said, for this session we want to kind of carry on thinking about what kind of structures are needed from Commonweal nationally and locally, between local groups, in local groups, um, to make the kind of things that, that you want to do as a group work. So to make that work well. So thinking about, again as I said, about what resources, what structures you need from national but also what participation you want to have in that national level. So I'll give you another two minutes to kind of sum up any other ideas you've got and then we'll come back and share those ideas with the group as a whole. Okay, I think we'll rein these discussions in a little bit, try and share some ideas across the whole group. So if everyone wants to finish those discussions now, we'll see what ideas we can share across. Um, group up the back there, you look the most ready. So I think the, the, the only group that's actually stopped talking so far. So you, you can kind of kick us off. So um, we've got the microphone going round. So remember this is being live streamed, so it is important that you speak into the microphone, otherwise people watching this in the comfort of their own homes won't be able to hear you. So start with the group at the back here. So are there any kind of key ideas you highlighted in terms of the structures of Commonweal, how local can be involved in national, how national can provide for local groups? Okay, we think to start with, we have to go back to square one with, with a proper membership list. So re-engage with the membership and obviously try and involve a wider membership. Um, there, there's been talk in our group about the fact that since 2014, all the groups that were involved in the independence campaign have become very fragmented and they've kind of gone back into their own little cabals and stopped communicating the way that they did at that time. So somehow, Although communities are more empowered, somehow we've got to get that communication going again so that people are all talking. Um, we definitely think community councils have got a part to play. And it's interesting tonight that only one community councillor in Danoon is here. Um, communication key throughout all of this. That, that's, I think, the main point that, that this group came up with. Um, also, somebody needs to take a lead. Um, everybody seems to be waiting on somebody to fire the starting gun for, for things to happen. So, 
are the Commonweal the group to do that? Well, we, we don't know, but we've, we've acknowledged that somebody needs to take a lead. And we think that there's a, a place for a Commonweal group in every town in Scotland, and that's something that should be taken forward. Okay. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much. So, communication there was one of the key ideas. I think I jumped in your group a little bit there, and that seemed to be a key point you were raising there. Did that come up in any of the other groups? Did anyone else highlight, you know, communication as one of the key things that needs to be, you know, improved or built up from scratch, as, as you mentioned? Um, I think from our perspective, we were talking about leadership as well um, and the need for a, a vision that's moved beyond um, 2014. We were encouraged to think like we were independent, so we feel that Commonweal has maybe got that, um, that potential to begin to think um, beyond what do we actually need to do in terms of economy, democracy. Um, we feel that the use of IT is crucial in our Island Butte um, and resources. How can Commonweal um, support us to engage with much more remote and rural communities than Dunoon and Cowell? Um, and the ethos of all of us first, um, and maybe the need to think about pushing some of those challenges. Um, why is there a need for us it to be all of us first? Okay, that's brilliant. So I think there's some good stuff there about the kind of general vision and the kind of you know gu guiding vision for 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 the the uh, movement in a sense. Um, you mentioned the kind of you know um, resources that that National would provide. Did you discuss any ideas of specifically what kind of things you'd like to see change or like to see happen? Things that aren't there already. Um, we brought up about um, the use of the word national um, and how that's a government use of words and um, sort of national organisations use that, they differentiate between national and local and that's where the leadership um, role really came out that we shouldn't be using words like national, we should be using leadership and um, how can we actually engage closer. So it was more around um, the terminology I think rather than resources specific. But Okay, brilliant, thanks very much. Yes, we've got a point well done. It's quite interesting that the previous group we spoke to, um, we, when we were talking about how do we refer to the, uh, sorry, as, as Commonweal, the Commonweal Glasgow, um, they, they preferred the word national over words like central. They didn't like centralised power, they preferred a national campaign. You're right, terminology is important, um, and it's maybe something to have a broader discussion over. But it's interesting to see where people, where, where people arrive at on that spectrum. I'm not saying anyone's wrong. Just, just the very back corner. Uh, hello. Again. Uh, is, this, is this my show or something? Okay, anyway, uh, Morrison's supermarket uh, and the press. Uh, the national newspaper gets put down in the bottom, out of the way, hidden away, and the the only print newsprint, the only, the, the only newsprint there is, is the Daily Hitler, the Daily Mail. So every time I go in there, I just pick, pick the national up. Uh, so that people can see the Scottish view. And uh, if people, more people did that and left the national lying on platforms, just, you know, etc., on park benches so that the more people can see what's, what we're being, what's been done to us. I mean, we are England and the Seven Dwarfs, and we've got to get out of that. Okay. Um, um, my signal group on the back there, so is there anything else that came out of your discussion? Again, think, picking up on what the other groups have, have kind of, you know, started us off with. Um, we spent a lot of the session there trying to establish um, what the common wheel was really about. I mean, there are people here who um, hadn't been involved in any of the previous sessions. Uh, and as such, I think we could have done with having a little bit of more of background of common wheel here before launching into this process. Um, again, I, get that, I guess comes down to the idea of communication. Uh, having been involved in the earlier 
groups here. Um, what happened was you just sort of disappeared and it left a vacuum. And um, it, 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 without direction or leadership, as has been mentioned, there, there was no drive, there was no real uh, um, impetus to, to keep things going. And of course, there are other groups uh, at the same time that are uh, involved in, in similar process. And uh, you know, the, again, communication is going to be vital as to how these different groups uh, communicate with each other and, um, and work together. Because um, you don't want all these groups working apart and, and such. So it would be better, um, I think, with the communication and letting us know what the ideals are and um, really just what the aspirations are for, for local groups and how that feeds into the national uh, picture. Thank you. So just, just to kind of stick with that point there, so was, was there any ideas you had concretely about how the local groups could feed into national? So, so how, how local groups might be involved in, for example, national, you know, kind of uh, key national campaigns, key national policies, or anything that came up in your group on that? We didn't really get that far because I, I think without the initial top down, uh, it's going to be difficult to drive that to, uh, grassroots upwards. Um, so I would have thought at this time we're looking for some direction from above as to how uh, the, the, the basic structure can be there and then we can uh, work on um, uh, changes or amendments or how we, we think that might be better uh, managed. Okay. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so lastly, the group down here. So someone's to grab the microphone. Tell us a little bit about some of the some of the key issues that came up in your discussion. <laughs> Volunteers better than ten press men, I suppose. Um, first of all, my name's Stuart Allen, the chair of ES Helens were in Lomond. Uh, and obviously I can only when it comes to ES groups, I can only really talk about our ES organisation, about our ES group. And it's one of the things that the, the lady over there said, the first speaker, uh, you know, about um, the fragmentation uh, after the two thousand fourteen campaign. I think the loss of Yes, Scotland, when they had that central core, when they had, uh, you know, people giving us the direction that we had to go in, uh, the information that was there, that's what drove the Yes movement. And when Yes, Scotland finished the day after the referendum, people were wandering about like lost sheep, uh, not knowing where to go. And that really hasn't changed. It, it's not progressed any. We then, I mean, Helms were, uh, yes, Helms were in Lomond. Uh, we took a conscious decision because uh, I think there was four of us didn't join the SNP out of about uh, well, out of over a hundred members, uh, and it sort of left us in the position that our yes group was made up of four members and another 96 SNP members, and that was all we got. So every time we come in, it was SNP business. It was all that was all we spoke about, and we, we, we sort of left yes in the back burner. So we made a conscious decision to put the yes movement, to put the yes group on the back burner, and just leave it until after the elections were finished, the Scottish election, the general election, and uh, the local elections to a certain degree as well. That's now changed. Yes, Ellen's been in Lomans back. Uh, we're back again. We're, we're sort of building up a group again. But again, I'm finding the same, uh, you know, where I'm talking to people within the group and people are saying, you know, what's happening, what are we doing? But they're looking for that guidance. They're looking for the replacement for Yes Scotland. Now, can the Commonweal fill that void? I don't know, uh, is the answer. Does the Commonweal want to fill that void or should it fill that void? I'm not entirely sure. But I do know one thing, if the Commonweal doesn't, engage with the yes movements and the local, the local yes groups, when it comes time for somebody to take up that mantle again, the common wheel will be pushed aside and be, and be left out. And that is a fear for me because I don't want that to happen because the, the ideas that are coming out of the common wheel are, are fantastic. That's me. Uh, and I, th I mean, I think that's what's happening a lot all over the country, you know, with the yes groups. I think the yes groups are feeling at the moment they've been sort of left behind and they're, uh, you know, they don't have any national support there. 
uh, the national registry should help with that. You know, once uh, once that is uh, fully functioning, because I think there's still a, a few uh, a few wee gremlins in there uh, stopping that from functioning properly. Hopefully, that will that will work better. But the common wheel for we have a, a monthly meeting in Helensburgh for common wheel, and we have a monthly meeting of the yes uh, of the yes group in Helensburgh as well. And we end up talking about the same things. And it's the same people talking about the same things. So to get new members into either of those groups is difficult because they get fed up. You know, it's, we look about here, yes, the weather plays a part, it's a time of night, it's a weekday, people have been working, people are on holiday, everybody's got an excuse not to, not to come along at a political meeting, we get that. Uh, and it's up to us to encourage people, to engage with people, to get them into these groups and to keep them there as well, but also to turn them into activists. Now, the common wheel for me, this is one of the things that we were discussing, uh, you know, about the, the, should it be from the ground up or should it be from the top down? I think it needs to be a bit of both. I think the people who have structured the common wheel, uh, you know, yourselves included, you know, you, you should be sort of giving us the indicators of, of what the common wheel stands for and giving us the ideas to talk about, you know, the discussion points and things like that, for us to then get the bones of that discussion and bring it back to the hierarchy of the, of the common wheel. Uh, and get that sort of spread about nationally if it's a good idea. How do we do that nationally? I don't know. Uh, you know, there's any number of ways we, we, we do it, but obviously in this meeting shows it as well. We need to do it and we need to do it kind of quickly as well. Brilliant, yeah. Fantastic, yeah. And I think a lot of really, really, really important points raised there. Um, before we kind of move on to discussion, I just wanted to see, is there anyone who kind of wanted to chip in on any of this who hasn't had a chance yet? Like to maybe throw a few words in, add something, disagree with something. Don't all have to agree. Oh, do you want to wait for the microphone just so the people at home can hear you? Hi. Um, I'd like to know the difference from your guys' perspective between an urban and a rural perspective on what, how things have gone so far. Because I think in a rural environment, it's a little bit different from, from being in an urban environment especially when it comes to calling meetings and who can attend and who's active. As, 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 as the gentleman was saying, it's, it's, we are spread thinly across a large area. So to get people here is kind of hard. So I'd like to know your guys' perspective from Commonweal on working in an urban versus a rural environment. i just say for, from one part, I think in terms of the survey, something we, we can do, because the data we've got is see the difference in responses from people. So what people are saying in terms of the key campaigns, the key values, um, the kind of structures they want to see, what they want to see from Commonwealth, it would be possible to separate that out and see if there's di different needs that are being very clearly expressed in the survey. I don't know if Craig, you want to add anything? Yeah, certainly I can speak a little to those, those issues um, because I, I am familiar with the, the urban groups like uh, Commonwealth, Glasgow South. Glasgow South, you can walk across in less than an hour. My local group is uh, Commonwealth South Lanarkshire. South Lanarkshire is almost the size of Luxembourg. So, <laughs> and, and I come from sort of rural Clydesdale. Uh, so I definitely know that there's, there's <laughs> we're very acutely aware that there's a, a, a big disparity there. It's not an easy thing to solve. Uh, something I learned over the last uh, couple of elections is in Clydesdale there are 227 miles of farm driveway <laughs> in Clydesdale. <laughs> I've driven them. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's not easy. Um, especially when in, you, 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 the standard issue answer for this sort of thing was, well, you have social media. Often not in rural areas where you barely have broadband. <laughs> so it is, it is an issue where you, you do need to find your local groups and, and they, they need to be very self-reliant and autonomous um, and tightly knit. Um, and, and that's also quite. Uh, that's also something that's easier in rural areas um, compared to cities where you can live around a thousand people and not know a single one. I think that's a really important point there. So as well as thinking about communication, obviously communication happens in formal ways. It happens in informal ways that are often as, if not more, important. Um, I was wondering what kind of maybe from your own experience in, in, in the local group you're involved in, or ideas you've got, what do you think could aid that communication at the local level? So, you know, yourself, you mentioned people coming along to political meetings, and you know, not always the most exciting meeting, it can often be quite alienating for a lot of people. 
what other kind of things might we do I, in, in a kind of rural area where actually people are spread out? Uh, it's difficult to, of, of, to often communicate in a lot of ways. What kind of things could a local group do, do you think, to increase participation and get more people in? Have you got any ideas from, from experience, what's worked, what hasn't worked in the past? In our group we were discussing um, the need to actually provide space for people to come together. So in our Island group that's a massive issue. Um, even trying to organise an event in one town um, is a massive issue in our Island group. Hence the, the suggestion of live streams so that other people in other areas can have access to it. I think there's people here who work actively within our Gailin Butte um, and are aware of the challenges around rurality and about people being able to travel, I think there's a need to come together um, in that basis um, and try and find a, a joint approach for people meeting. Um, I think that is an, a real issue in our Gailin Butte. Um, Travelling to Helensborough, for instance, would be an hour and a half, one way, an hour and a half back, three hours from here, we go to one of the islands, you could be away for two days. Um, the national um, perspective needs to take that into account, I think, and we would be more than willing to, to work through that with people nationally um, about what's actually involved. There's a point up the back as well. Oh, you can leave the mic just because it's been live streamed so everyone can hear it. Okay, I'd just like to ask um, who finances you? Okay. Who finances the organisation? Surely you need money to, to organise meetings and to organise around the country, so could you tell me who finances you? Yeah, the common, Commonweal uh, as a whole is funded entirely by, by, by donors. We don't take any money from companies or, or government money or anything like that. In, the, in addition, a lot of our local um, groups are largely self self financing. They, they, they rely on their own donations uh, to to book halls and, and run events and organise merchandise and things like that. But if this is a if this is maybe a barrier that needs to be spoken about, then uh. how big is the organisation? You know, and, and who is that hierarchy? And there's the family tree. I haven't seen anything like that, and it would be interesting to find out where that comes from. So I can actually speak from experience on that, the, the, the local Commonwealth group in Helens, but as self-funding. Uh, we meet in uh, the Clyde Bar uh, once a month, uh, through in the back room in the Clyde Bar once a month, and at the end of every uh, every meeting we have a, a whip round and everybody gives uh, what they can. Uh, we obviously don't charge for admission or anything like that. Uh, likewise, uh, we had Paul from the, the Wee Ginger Dog Down. Uh, we had a whip round for Paul's expenses and then we had a whip round for uh, the common meal expenses and one for the pub as well because, you know, not everybody bought a drink when they come in. Uh, and John's very, very supportive of uh, what we do. Uh, but, yeah, all, for all intents and purposes, it's self-funding. Last time, I'm from, I'm from Clyde Bank, Red, Red Clyde side. Through the war, we, we were evacuated and everything. Uh, why don't we chase the socialists to, to join us more than we are at, the at this time? Get the socialists in, they'll push the liberal people out of the way, and we'll have a, a, ch a better chance. I mean, this is an interesting but it's come out of the, the, the survey results, so a lot of people kind of indicated the political values, political preferences they've got. You know, it is by and large centre-left to radical-left, the people who are involved in Commonweal, so it, it's happening perhaps, yeah, perhaps already, yeah. But also, um, networking with wider groups, that's come up a few times here, you know, in, in a lot of areas people are going to have to be working with different kinds of groups, different organisations, so again, there's, there's definitely an opportunity for that kind of thing to come up. Um, I was just wondering that in your common spaces, we obviously have an extremely successful uh, media, media platform. I'm wondering if it can be leveraged to... Uh
Again, I can only speak from experience uh, of what we've actually done down in Helensburg. Uh, but we have held a couple of uh, bat nights, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, a couple of entertainment nights, you know, having a few bands and things like that. Uh, and they've gone down really well, uh, gone down really well. Got some new membership from them as well. Most of that was round about 2014 and we haven't really done anything from that again. Uh, but in recent, the last month or so, we've been talking about it again. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we have been told, and this is sort of more through talking to uh, you know, the younger people in the community as well about what sort of thing they would engage with. And these are people who are independent supporters. You know, these are people who uh, you know, support the cause and all the rest of it and want to be involved with it. But just don't see it for them, you know, because it's the, the demographic and the, the yes movement is, you know, is certainly not 19. Uh, and basically, what they're saying is, you know, the likes of music, music afternoons, you know, music uh, workshops and things like that, uh, they would engage with that. Uh, they engage with that quite, uh, quite considerably as well. So we're thinking about doing that in Helensburg. But one of the other things we're thinking about in Helensburg as well. And it's actually it's a motion for the next yes meeting uh, that, that's going to be on the agenda, and it's about getting uh, into the communities street by street. You know, the, the, we've realised that the national leaflets, you know, even from the SNP, from the Yes movement and stuff like that, you know, they're, they're too generic. They're, they're too people don't engage with, with leaflets. You know, I, I get leaflets through the door. I put leaflets through the door half the time. I don't read them myself. Uh, but what they do engage with, they engage with people. You know, the, the people who chart the doors, you know, the canvassers that get around the doors, they engage with people. So if we can get that street by street, uh, even, you know, whether it's, house, whether it's house meetings or whether it's community hall meetings or taking the message to them. But I think it's got to be more than that. And this is where it's important for the Commonwealth to be part of this as well. It's not about us taking the message to them. It's about us getting the message from them to take it back. Because at the moment, in my own opinion, uh, politics in this country is broken. Uh, politics don't work in this country anymore, and we need to think outside the box in order to fix that. Uh, what terrifies me is, in an independent Scotland, is doing the same thing that we're doing just now, because we're just going to end up in exactly the same place again. Uh, it's not going to get any better for anybody. So we need to think radical, we need to think out of the box, and we need to start sort of moving that forward. And the only way we can do that is to sit in groups like this and find out what everybody wants, what everybody's frame of mind is. Uh, what is that, you know, what, what do you want for the future? What do you want for your kids? What do you want for yourself? Because every one of us is different. Every one of us has got a different idea, but we need, we'll find common ground in there somewhere if, if we work for it. Getting a hierarchy that's telling us this is the policy, this is what we're going to do, is just what we're doing just now, and it's no way to work. We need to get the message from the, the individuals, from the voters, and uh, you know, in, in their own streets, in their own houses, to get that message back up to the hierarchy. And the only way to do that is for all the independence groups to join up and, and do that together, and that includes Commonweal, the Yes movement, and, and anybody else that wants to be part of that. Okay, fantastic. We've got time for one last point. Um, should, we, should, should we take this one last point very, very briefly? Okay. Brian Quayle, the anti-nuclear man, was jailed at Coolport. We could get bucketfuls of press out of that, surely to goodness, because it, it's illegal and it's fattening and it's going to kill the world. Thank you. This particular, okay. this particular story in actually Common Space has been doing some fairly extensive coverage on. Okay, thanks very much everyone for that. Um, this is just the start of this conversation. This will go on over the, over the coming months. So everything you've said here will feed into that. You'll have a chance to participate more in this, in this kind of conversation. For now, I'm going to hand over to Craig, who's going to take you through some of the key kind of policy agendas for the, for the domestic policy. Hi guys. I'll give you a moment. Yeah, don't get too uh, comfortable all staring at me because you're going to be turning around again soon. <laughs> now, first I'm going to just give a, a little bit of an apology that um, 
obviously we we didn't have a uh, we didn't know who was going to turn up tonight as a, an open uh, open to the public meeting and we've obviously got a, a very mixed audience here uh, now can i just get a wee show of hands of the people who either had no real idea of what commonweal was or only a vague ish idea of what commonweal was before they came up here today hmm. and how many of you are you know, either long-time members of Commonweal or actively involved in your local Commonweal group. So, yeah. So we're kind of split down the middle on that one. Right, so I'm going to pull things back just a little and just explain, you know, who we are and what we stand for. You know, Commonweal is a, ostensibly, we, we, you've heard the phrase, we, we, we started out as a think tank where we came up with interesting radical policies for Scotland, uh, both in the context of independence and in the context of the, 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 uh, the current uh, situation and the domestic uh, situation. Um, and we've also developed as part of an activist group as well. So we have, as we say, about 50 local groups, uh, step away from these mics, uh, 50 local groups across the country uh, who, who focus on the local areas and championing, championing either local causes or bringing sort of national campaigns to the local areas. Uh, this uh, tour that we're currently on, visiting the areas, was designed to try and engage with these local groups to see how we can strengthen these bonds um, from the sort of national level to the local groups and from the local groups to the communities so we can help those campaigns just function better. Um, and so that we can, you know, speak to the people who, who don't, who um, haven't been part of the movement for as long or haven't been as active in the movement and see how we can bring them in a little, a little closer and how we can get them a bit more engaged. Uh, <clears throat> now, another one of our big projects recently was, has, has been the White Paper Project. This is our independence campaign. Is there anyone here who's familiar with that? Yep, a few. Uh, this, um, if we think back to the 2014 independence campaign, we had the, the Scottish Government come out with their, their Scotland's Future white paper, a big tome that I'm sure we all read and loved. <laughs> um, I think I've got half the cabinet still have signatures in mine because we were a bit of a fanboy back then. <laughs> um, now this, this document, it, it, we call that a white paper, it wasn't really a white paper in the most technical sense, but half of that document was, these are the powers that will come to Scotland upon independence. The other half of that document was more, and this is what we, the Scottish Government, would do with those powers. So it was as much a manifesto as it was an independence white paper. Now, what we've tried to do uh, is to get a look at that paper again, break it down to its, to its elements and rebuild it, rebuild the, the case for independence because Scotland as a country has changed since then. The case for independence has changed somewhat since then. Um, and what we are really focusing on in that document is the infrastructure that we would need to build if we became a, a, an independent country tomorrow. For example, a lot of our civil service is currently based in London in the Scotland office and in Whitehall. That has to be rebuilt in Scotland. We, we, we needed civil service just to run the government. All of our welfare uh, policies are run, are, are, ba are basically reserved. A lot of the paperwork is done up in Scotland, but all the policies are determined in London. So we need to rethink how we do welfare. If we want to launch our own currency, then we need a central bank. We need foreign reserves. We need to know how to launch a currency. So our white paper has been going through uh, policies like that, breaking them down, explaining them, and backing them up with uh, well-developed research papers behind them. At the same time, we've got another project called Renew. This is focusing on our domestic agenda. Because while we're not independent yet, doesn't mean we can't do anything. There's loads that Scotland can do right now with the powers that we have. And you don't just become a completely new country overnight just because you vote for it. One way of becoming a new country is to build a new country. 
So if we start doing things differently, we become a different country. And we can build the, the, the country we want to be. You have the little leaflets on your, on your chairs there. These are a, a, an extremely simplified bullet point form of a book that we published a little while ago called The Book of Ideas. If you're really interested in it, we have some over on the table for sale. I'm sure our colleague Tiffany can help you with that. This is 101 ideas that Scotland could do now. Uh, ranging from things like childcare to the National, National Investment Bank, which could uh, help boost the, the, the economies of especially rural areas like this that often get ignored. Um, so, really what I'd like to do in, in this, this workshop, workshop session that's coming up is to think about policies. Think about the th type of things that you would want Scotland to do. Uh, think about the type of things that you would want Scotland to do when it's independent and think about the kind of things that you want Scotland to do now. Um, and especially think about the kind of things that your local area could use and could do now. Things like perhaps you want a tool library in your, in, in your town where instead of everyone having to, 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 to buy a full set of tools when really all they need is a hammer and then the whole thing's going to sit in a cupboard for five years, why not have a tool library where you can just borrow what you need when you need it and where you could hold workshops to show people how to repair furniture, for instance, so that if they, if they break a slat in their bed, they don't need to buy a full new bed. Maybe they get really interested and start making their own furniture and selling it in the local community. And of course, if you've got a place where people can come and learn new skills, they also meet new people. You build new bonds in the community. It's one idea. And this is something that actually one of our, one of our uh, groups up in Edinburgh has been championing. So um, just to give an example of, of, of what some of the groups have been, have been doing. So again, I'd just like you to Break up into your groups, um, mix the room a little if you want to get some fresh, fresh ideas from other people, and use the the little um, the little blue pamphlet of ideas there if you want uh, for inspiration. Yep. Sorry, Craig. Can I just ask: Is this an opportunity for people to actually write down the sort of project that you gave an example of that's already happening locally? Certainly. So. Think of new ideas, but also think highlight things that highlight are things that are being done now. Highlight how they happened yeah. and how they could be done better. So we, new we and would, existing. Because yeah. if, if, for example, if you could tell another group how to do something that's worked really well in your area, this is a good chance to do it. Or if there's something that you, you actually you don't know how to do, but you see you see the problem, you don't know the solution, and you'd like another group to tell to, to help you out then this is the sort of idea that can come back to us and we can feed on uh, as we develop the communication networks. Okay.
okay folks so we've got about half an hour ish left in the night um, so I'll just give you a minute or so just to gather your thoughts and reorganize yourselves and then we can have a wee chat about what you've discussed Okay folks, how are we doing? This is a problem with nights like this. You start talking policy and everybody gets really into it and they don't stop till three in the morning. We now, we now have a couple of roving mics, so I'll uh, save the shoe leather and the, and the helpers back there. Right, who wants to go first? Okay, okay this is my suggestion. Yeah, this is an <laughs> absolute... Well, we assisted, but um, we would... Um, Picking up on some of the policy ideas, um, focusing around young people. Um, so we would really like to work with Commonweal. Um, in Argyll and Butte, the issue of young people um, leaving Argyll and Butte and not necessarily returning is a real, real issue. Um, and the suggestion is to to look at um, a pilot project in Argyll and Butte um, at Life College. Um, where it's encouraging young people to be able to travel. Um, it's encouraging um, young people to gain the skills of building a house. Um, there's a recent um, advert for um, two plots of land um, at Kilfinnan um, where people who have a connection with the local area um, are encouraged to build their own house. Um, so that's what I meant earlier on about what things are already happening yep. here and how can we actually really begin to yeah. um, promote that on a much wider scale. Um, also get young people thinking about their local environment, um, how can they actually support the work that's been done around about that. Um, and the thought also around our Gail and Butte being too big thinking about other policy areas about how you need to reduce the size of local authorities. But again, just to conclude with the, the young people's work, um, we would like to take Meryl's idea forward and um, that's what we would be wanting to work with the common real on. So do you have a, an idea of what maybe the, lo the common real local group could do directly to encourage well, this or engage with it or think, directly get involved? I think locally um, certainly the Commonweal group could pull together what's existing around young people. Um, I think they could work with particularly the local authority, third sector organisations about what 
potentially could happen with that? Um, and is there opportunity to um, look at additional funding for um, mm. that um, out with public sector? The intention is that kids would get a chance between 16 and 19 to discover the world by staying at home and then at 19 be able to think do I want to go to university? Do I want um, a loan? How, what, do, what, I'm in, what am I really interested in? Understanding more about the world we live in. So it's not saying we want to keep you at home forever. Mm. It's sending them out with a sense that um, they're full rounded citizens. They're not going out there to um, learn how to make a profit and um, do other people in, basically. Yeah. That what simple. I, I, I re I'm reminded of a, an idea that came out of the EU recently, which was to give young people, I think it was between 16 and 24, uh, sort of long distance travel cards that allowed them just to jump on a train and go anywhere in Europe. I wish I had that opportunity when I was that age. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so maybe, maybe those ideas, or even just seeing different parts of Scotland. But um, just going back to the, the the potential of bringing in bringing in different different uh, different organisations, that sounds like the the seed of a, a really good local event. Are we, are we sort of maybe? I don't want to have more meetings like like like, no. well, like this, but maybe a little festival type thing or an exhibition uh, to bring all these people into the same room where they can talk and organise it. What did you call it again? A life, yeah, a life, life college, college, yeah. Funded by basic income. Hmm. Yeah, that's another big idea that's uh, gaining traction, basic income. <laughs> Keep at that one. Right. Who's next in the in the, the spotlight? Don't all step back at once. Leave someone forward. <laughs> um, I think what our group ended up kind of more focusing on was um, accountability and open democracy, hmm. especially within a Gallen Butte Council because it is so such a large area and that the that the that the administration has withdrawn so many powers into itself that the function of councillors has been reduced and due to that the local area committees uh, the meetings have been reduced from six to four months from yep. six a year to four a year yeah and if there's something what What's, what's also kind of awkward is that they take place in Dunoon, the local area committee take place in Dunoon, Rossi and Helensborough. So if there's an issue in Dunoon that's been discussed in Helensborough, and it's usually at 10 o'clock in the Monday morning, yep. the, the attendance there is pretty low. So there's, there is a campaign out at the minute to, um, uh, to have the, all of these meetings live streamed so that people can actually catch up and observe and see what's actually taking place. But the administration doesn't want to do that. Is it seen as a as one one party's policy that they that they disagree with and they don't want yeah. to bring it into, to fruition, which is really unfortunate because it actually shows what's actually happening within Kilmory and at the local area committee meetings. Uh, so we we kind of went round that and discussed that quite a bit, and uh, and I agree with what you what you said earlier in terms of a lot of the impetus. And the focus and the and the great fun that was had during the, the ref campaign has kind of kind of has morphed into kind of kind of resigned waiting for that day. Mm -hmm. But I think if people can get active locally and do start doing stuff within their own communities, and there's plenty to get done. Uh, there's there's lots of conversations, but there's no one standing up to the plate to say, you know what, I'll take this on. And we've been having crazy conversations on. On Facebook within a community council on exactly that issue, uh, the lack of toilet provision for, you know, if you're from Dunedin, it's on a community council one of these issues that can, comes up very pretty regularly, and that's a local issue. 
But how could Common Wheel come in and help us with our toilet issue? I've got absolutely no idea. <laughs> but, uh, but these, it's this basic, it's these things that, 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 that are con we're confronted day to day that, that we're so used to actually acquiescing and giving that power to somebody else yeah. to take care of. And it's time we actually got localized, almost a borough re-engagement yeah. at a borough level, yeah. as opposed to having such large, especially for a girl in Butte, it's, it's so cumbersome. We need, a, we need a kind of a borough, a borough system once more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we produced a paper uh, a few years ago on the, the state of Scottish democracy in Scotland is the least decentralised country in Europe. Uh, and I mentioned before I'm from South Lanarkshire, which is almost the size of Luxembourg. I have one local council, which normal European countries would call a region ath regional authority, and Luxembourg would probably call their national government. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, 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 the democratic deficit at a local level in Scotland is, is getting very acute. Just on the live streaming thing, a, a little sneaky question I like to ask councillors when they say that they're not in favour of web, webcasting is, so what conversations do you have that you don't want me to know about? Yeah. <laughs> Can yep. I just add, though, that we need to be careful here that we separate out things that we can do as a country now yep. without independence yep. and things that we can't do. And that actually is one of the things that we can do now. And yes. We've got all the powers that we require to sort out local government. Absolutely. It's completely undemocratic. So. Absolutely. This is, this is something that you could be petitioning your, your local representatives now. Um, the Scottish Government has said some things about uh, bringing power back down to local level, but they haven't said much more than that yet. Uh, I'd really, really like to see some details from them. So if anyone has any contacts with the local representatives, maybe now's the time to start pressing that as an issue. Well, can I just say to you that this is actually maybe one that Common Meal might want to take up in terms of policy? Yeah. Because there's a golden opportunity with um, the devolution of the Crown Estate and one of the ways in, why, in which you could sort a lot of things out is to actually put the income from the Crown Estate pro rata to the community councils, yep. not to the councils, not to the government. That would dramatically change things because it would give community councils a purpose, a function and money to do things. Yeah, that's definitely something that, that, that could be looked at. But it won't happen. <laughs> Only while people say it won't. <laughs> Things tend to happen when the last person who said no stops. Yeah. I think it's also important then, if we talk about Crown Estates, so the beach, the shore that go around. So in our Island Butte, that's obviously massive yeah. then. And do we actually understand that? That is it not the same distance as the French coastline. Um, so actually, in our Island Butte, that's massive for yeah. us. Um, and is that something that Commonweal nationally can support Commonweal in our Island Butte to begin to have those conversations? Now, this is something that could very well tie into campaigns like Our Land. The Our Land campaign is a, a great pusher of, of, of bringing to light land ownership issues. They've co often focused on things like common ground, um, very few people understand the rights that they have on local common ground or even that they have local gr common ground in their area or in worst cases where people have sold off the, lo the common ground where you know th they didn't have the right to do that. Um, I don't know if they've said too much about the Crown Estate thing but uh, definitely that then immediately becomes part of that issue. Yep. Down here. If folk who haven't talked tonight uh, want to get an opportunity, you know, please just stick your hand up. It's one of the things we discussed there as a, a group. It was one of the things that was mentioned. We were talking about uh, the investment bank uh, and how do local people, how do individuals uh, influence anything to do with an investment bank? You know, that's something that would normally come from government. It's normally something that would come from lobby groups and things like that. And one of the things that, you know, one of the, the, the ways that I see that, that we could influence that and Commonweal could influence that, because Commonweal has, you know, if you read the, 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 the papers that were written on uh, the investment, a National Investment Bank for Scotland, there are absolutely some fantastic ideas in there. Uh, 
but how do we get that into fruition? You know, how, how do we get that into the public eye? Uh, the first thing we need to do uh, is engage with people. We need to start talking to people. Um, the, we have this, I mean, I, I, I spoke to a group earlier on, uh, and I, I, I commonly refer to, uh, to our political system now as X-Factor politics. It's something that people do uh, once every four or five years, they go out and they vote and they think that's it. They don't realise that politics is a day-to-day -day thing that happens, it affects every aspect of their life. Now, when it comes to an investment bank, what you could have is uh, for the common wheel to have these ideas and to have these, these suggestions, and for local common wheel meet meetings to then bring them to the more politicised groups like the Yes group, the SNP groups and all the rest of it, where you do actually have a bit of poli political uh, muscle. You know, you, do, you can persuade your politicians, your local politicians, and then put pressure on them. That's not going to work unless you have many voices. If you've only got one voice, you know, one person saying, I like an investment bank, I think it's a good idea, the politician's only going to listen to you. But if you've got a thousand people in your community saying, I like the idea of an investment bank, your politicians would be mad not to listen to them. And if they don't listen to them, then the X Factor politics does, yeah. does come into to play later on. But it's all about education. It's about educating ourselves and it's about educating the people around about us as well that your vote, politics is more than just your vote, it's your voice as well. And if you don't use both of them, then nothing's ever going to change. What was it that Plato said? Those who disengage with polit from politics end up governed by their, inf their inferiors. <laughs> um, was it the People's Council in Oban? How long ago was that now? Is it, but the big, the big event, two years ago now? Yes, there's, there's the People's Council that meets within a gallon butte and they had, they had a, made a massive get together and in that get together the concept of a local authority bank was put forward and this is something we can actually do now because the yep. legislation is in place. Yep. And it's essentially, if you want to divest and invest, it's about the creation of local authorities across Scotland, creating their own their, their own bank through the local authority and using the, they want their own assets, and divesting and then reinvesting within the community. That's something that can happen now. We don't have to wait for it. It can be a, it can be precursor banking systems for the for, for what can happen in Scotland Central, but it would allow local authorities access to funds. Um, so if, if they followed through on this, to do works projects and reinvest in the community, and that's something that's been there was that's two, the two years it was suggested. It was try, I think it was tried to go into one of the manifestos, but it's too scary of an idea. Mm. Can the local authority run a bank? Because it, 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 I would want that bank to run out with the fiat currency system that we have at the minute, and doing that is dodgy because you're going to have to have a lender of last resort, so the Bank of International Settlements or someone you can actually borrow from and to. But if we can, if we could, if, if someone could actually look into that concept and see, take it further. Yeah, now, as you say, a lot of the material is already there because the legislation is there. It's, it's just going to take a bit of will to do it. Um, on a related note, because you're, you're concerned of currency, I mean, uh, Commonwealth produced a paper a wee, while, a wee while ago on the concept of introducing uh, local currencies. Uh, there's now, uh, places like Bright, um, Brighton and Brixton have their own local currency. Um, it functions more or less like a like a voucher system. It's fully backed up by a local credit union, um, but your your ten Brixton pounds can only be can only be spent in local Brixton establishments. Um, and even if your local Tesco decides to accept them, it can't then ship that Brixton pound off to the Cayman Islands to dodge tax. So uh, this, is a, this is an idea that helps boost the local economy. Maybe that's another, another thing that can be explored in parallel with that. Anyone else? Anyone who hasn't spoken tonight who has a burning question? There's only a few hundred of them in the live stream. <laughs> no? 
Yeah. Well, this uh, is your night. You've asked us yeah. quite a lot about our ideas, you know, yeah. about where we see Commonweal going. Where, ideally, would you see Commonweal situated? Hmm. <laughs> it's one of those easy questions. <laughs> um, we are still very small movement, and you've seen tonight. There's, there's people who have come out have come out here in a midweek evening, in a lovely evening. You should be down at the beach <laughs> uh, to come and listen to us talk about politics. Um, and a, a few of the people who've come here didn't really know about us. So if you went out onto the street and you asked just what is common, we'll I doubt you'd get an answer. So I would like to see more visibility for the, 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 the movement uh, on a street level, all the way up to a government level. Now, we do talk to the government. Um, they, they certainly know of us and they certainly read our papers. Um, we don't get a lot of it view in the media. Uh, I would like to see a bit more of that. Um, could any of you imagine someone like Robin McAlpine on Question Time? I'm sure that would draw an audience. <laughs> so, I, ideally, yeah, I, I would. I mean, you get other lobby groups um, like Reform Scotland and Fraser of Allender, who, you know, they barely need to sniff and they'll, they'll easily get a headline. We we quite often get a lot of coverage in the national, but beyond that, we don't get a lot. Um, so, maybe it's going to take campaigns from folk who do read the other papers to write letters in and, and build a bit of awareness at that level until they start taking notice. It's going to take more people strengthening the local groups and getting involved in their, uh, the local high streets. I've heard a few people mention the idea of stalls and they quite, they're quite hard work and you need, you need a lot of material and you need to, a lot of dedication to be out there week after week, but they are a highly visible campaign tool. Um, if, if you're walking down the street and every Saturday you see the the Commonweal logo everywhere and then you're reading the paper and you see someone talking about Commonweal and then you turn on the news and they're talking about a Commonweal policy. You know, that's how ideas start to filter into the people who aren't so engaged with politics. So that's kind of where I'd like to see us, us grow. Um, can I ask if it's possible to have some more um, online social media, media material um, from Commonweal that we can actually begin to, um, different policy ideas, a breakdown to those policies yeah. that we can actually put out through um, social media in our Gaelan view? Yeah. Now, this is something that we're, we're very actively engaged in at the moment is that, you know, if I write a paper on currency, it's a 30 page document on macroeconomics, not everybody's going to read that. <laughs> I'm going to freely admit that. So we are wanting to try and break this down into a more easily digestible leaflet form, perhaps even videos, short three-minute videos that can be easily shared on Facebook and Twitter and whatnot. It means you're going to see a lot more of this face, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, I can't do anything about it. <laughs> but yeah, if, if it's, uh, yeah, I think that's something that's, that's essential. It sounds like Commonweal is kind of beginning to stray into the territory of a political party. <laughs> so could we see in the future people actually stand up for election under the banner of Commonweal? Right. Now, this is this is a difficult one because you can see that we're not we don't look a lot like a think tank. In some ways, we do look like more more like a political party. We don't want to really become one, um, largely because right now. Our big success story the last year was trying to get, was getting the, the commitment to a national investment bank onto the SNP manifesto. We did that by engaging the SNP groups and they took it to the conference, passed a motion on it, and it's now on their policy list. You'll also have noticed that Jeremy Corbyn started talking about it. Again, he, he saw what was happening up here and he contacted us and we sent him down the material and he multiplied the numbers by 10 and called it a UK investment bank. Um, that's the advantage of being non-political. We can talk to the SNP, we can talk to the Greens, we can talk to Labour, we can talk to any party that wants to develop our ideas. Um, so it allows us to, to be a bit more, a bit more inclusive about the policies. And you know, some some of some of the, the the members here, you know, they, they are members of the political party as well. We don't want to make them feel excluded by saying that, well, we're now a formal political party. So if you're in a if you're in a party, you you have to pick one. Um, we, we quite like the idea that we can engage with, with as many parties as possible that way. Is there anything else? 
Any other final questions on anything, if we want to broaden the topic out for the last five minutes? Or do we want to wrap up here and enjoy the, enjoy the sunset? <laughs> yep. Is that one more hand? You want to? No? Oh, thank, you, thank you all for coming. As I say, this was, this was very much your night. We were trying to get your ideas uh, as much as we were trying, trying, to, um, trying to present ours. Um, so, yeah, th thank you all for coming and engaging. Well, I'm sure we've taken quite a few, quite a few lessons from, from tonight and we can take them to the other groups that we're, we're speaking to on this, on this tour. Uh, we're away up to Sky tomorrow, so I'm sure they're going to have a, a whole load of issues that are, are relevant to this area. Uh, they're going to have a whole load of issues that are unique to their area. Uh, and I do hope that once we've, we've finished this tour and we've engaged with uh, uh, the, the groups from all kinds of areas, we can draw something together and we'll, we'll collate our, our lessons somehow and we'll start putting them back out to you as well so you can, you can see, the, see the results. So, yeah, once again, thank you for coming and thank, thanks, thanks again to, for, for Thomas for his, for his survey and presenting his results. And, um, and can I just quickly say, anyone that wants to add their name and email address, please do, so we can keep in touch, um, because we'll be planning on putting something together yeah. that we can send out to everyone, all, all the review and all these meetings and what our plan is for moving forward. So I'll just be sitting up here, okay? And Thanks. finally, we also have leaflets and badges and things that you can help yourself to, and we've got some books for sale as well, if you, if you, if you want them. Thank you. <laughs>